Good evening and welcome. Uh, we're going to call to order our joint meeting of the Katati State Council and the successor agency to the former Katati Community Redevelopment Agency for Tuesday, October 11, 2016. We've just convened from closed session regarding labor negotiations and do not have anything to report out yet on that. And with that, we will uh, do a roll call. Ms. Burgess? Council Member Skillman? Here. Council Member Deloso? Here. Mayor Moore? Here. Vice Mayor Harvey? Here. Council Member Landon? Here. Thank you. And if you'd all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Mr. Barrett, you will have the opportunity to speak on that item on the non-action items at the end of the agenda. By law, I would request to speak at this time. You and the local district attorney has asked me to keep asking at the appropriate time to speak on this issue for the record. You are certainly welcome to address that at the non-action items at the uh, at later on in the agenda. That's not acceptable, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm giving you the opportunity to speak. It's just not when you want to speak. It's when it's on the non-action items on the agenda. Thank you. That, that the public is able to speak on during or under any action, under any item under, the, under consideration. You just said the pledge. Thank you, Mr. Verich. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm familiar with the law. Now I'm looking for an approval of the minutes. Move to approve. Uh, I wonder if I could make an amendment to that. I noticed minutes are fine. One small thing. I remember we moved citizens' business up at the last meeting. I wonder if we could uh, add that change to that. So at the last, at the last meeting, we moved our, our uh, agenda item eight to item six. Exactly, yeah. Just with that small amendment, I would second that motion. Eight or nine? Uh, nine was from last week? Okay. okay. So the corrected numbers. Number nine to item number six. That's fine with my motion. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now we're going to go to announcements. The City of Katari has special open office hours open hours on Monday evenings from 5 to 7 p.m. by appointment in the Community Development Department at City Hall as part of its Katari Open for Business program. This program provides personalized assistance and information to developers, current Katari business owners, and those interested in starting a new business within the city. The Rental Park Katati Regional Library hosts events for all ages, including art exhibits, book clubs, and children's programs. All events are free and open to the public. For more information, call the library at 584-9121 or visit sonomalibrary.org. The Katati Historical Society Museum is open regularly the second Tuesday of each month from 5 to 7 p.m., Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m., and by appointment. <clears throat> For more, excuse me. For more information, call 794-0305. <clears throat> Citizens interested in receiving City of Katari community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up at Nixle, N-I-X-L-E dot com. Katari Fall Curbside Cleanup, October 17th through 21st. During this week, Katari residents may place extra trash contained in boxes or bags at the curb for collection on the regular collection day. And the city offers a variety of recreation programs for all ages. See details on the web at katadicity.org. Uh, moving back to the announcements on number 5E. I think the residents are eligible for up to four, 12 or 14 additional bags of refuse to be picked up. So if, if you get some cleanup, um, they will pick it up if you don't exceed those limits during that uh, cleanup period. Yeah, I'll also add to that there's the um, the flyer with um, from the from Mobile Empire Disposal with many more details is available on the website through your headlines. Thank you. And now we'll move on to presentations. Uh, 6A is PG&E Community Pipeline Safety Initiative. Thank you. So for tonight we have um, some representatives from PG&E that are going to present this item. Our one 
of you, Brian. Hello. Hi. Tech. I think you have the best tech of any council in Sonoma County. So. <laughs> Bear with me here. I always mess up the part where you make it full screen. Mm -hmm. Just click it. Yeah, you just hit the picture. <laughs> There we go. Hello. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Brian Botari from PG&E. To those I haven't met, um, I am your uh, liaison for Sonoma County um, Government Relations. I have with me my colleague, Darren Klein. He manages this program for our, uh, the western part of our service territory. It's called the Community Pipeline Safety Initiative. Um, the broad strokes is it's dealing with trees and structures over our gas transmission lines. So to, to set the stage really for what that means, gas transmission um, are analogous to the freeways, I guess, of the gas system, you would say. They're the high pressure lines. They deliver the gas long distances. So they're not everywhere in town. There are only really two areas in town that we're talking about when we talk about this program. So your, your pipes in town, uh, the main one runs right up Old Red, comes into town on Old Red, goes out on Old Red. And then you have another one um, that goes west on West Katati Avenue, hangs a left on Maple Avenue, and then runs out of town on Richardson Lane. So as we're hearing about this program tonight and when we're speaking to residents, those are the two areas that we're talking about uh, when we're talking about gas transmission. So um, I'll leave it to my colleague Darren here to run through the program really quickly, and then we will uh, answer any questions you may have. So thank you. Um, hi, Darren Klein uh, with PG&E. <clears throat> so as Brian was telling you, we have a gas transmission line, high pressure line. What that means is that line has to be made of steel. It's not plastic. Uh, distribution lines and service lines to the house can be plastic. What that also means is that the pressures of the pipe are going to be above 60 PSI. Um, 60 PSI and below is, is, is a different standard. Um, and it, what we're talking about is you're going to see transmission lines that have PSI in the hundreds, uh, around 100 to 140 that, that go through your town on any given day. So it, as Brian said, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different, it's a whole different pull of wax. So when we say that they're steel, they are steel. When they're put in the ground like this, because we live in earthquake country, we put uh, sand around them. No, not many other utilities do that because they don't have that kind of, of issue. But we pack sand around them, we put them in the ground, and that's where they live their life. And we've been looking at our pipe very differently in the, five, in the last five years. So you've been seeing a lot of us. And we're here to say you're going to see a lot of us, and you're going to continue to see a lot of us when it comes around to these things. What we've been doing is hydrostatic pressure testing. We put water into the pipe, run it much higher than the pressure would be, and see if there's any failures or any issues. We've been doing internal pipe inspection robots, which are actually MRIs of the pipe from the inside to make sure that there's still thickness of the walls. We've uh, been automating valves uh, in and around our territory. We've got roughly 285. We're going to add another 200. They all go back to a 24-hour gas transmission center in San Ramon, where we want to improve our emergency response to pipeline incursions, have it be somebody digging into the pipe by accident or, or anything else that could happen. So what that means is, for example, somebody was digging in Bakersfield. This was last year. Um, when they hit the pipe, we saw the anomaly in pressure, the change in pressure. And so we immediately started our protocol to shut down the pipe, even though we hadn't even gotten a call from police or fire telling us that there was a problem. It helps with our reaction time. 
We also do leak survey of the line. We like to mention these things because we do have these things called Picaro cars that will drive through your neighborhood and sniff out gas. They look like just like Google Maps cars, except they're in PG&E blue. A lot of people think, why is there a Google Map car driving through, taking pictures in the middle of the night? It's not taking pictures. It's in the middle of the night because that's the best time to sniff out any kind of gas leaks. It's improved our gas protection, our gas leakage protection 99%. It's, it's really cool. Um, and we also fly over the pipe about every five weeks. And it, it helps us to make sure that there aren't encroachments on the pipe, that there aren't things that are impeding first responder access. And as we've been doing this, we have one last big thing that we're bringing, and that is we've noticed there's a lot of vegetation. Trees, shrubs, sometimes structures. There are no structures here in Katati, I can assure you, but there are some trees and, and vegetation that we need to deal with. And what we are telling folks is this is not everywhere, but we are working with first responders. First responders are fire and police, but PG&E is also first responders. We're the ones that actually go in and shut off the pipe when there's a problem. Police are the ones who uh, keep the area protected uh, while we're doing that work. We've been working with them, making sure that we have immediate access to the pipe. We want to make sure that everybody understands if there's a tree that has to be replaced, it is being replaced. We are offering mitigation. Uh, we feel that we could have done a better job when it came to vegetation around these things. So we are offering trees to, to, to folks and offering what is the appropriate mitigation uh, depending on the size of tree and stuff like that. Um, we make sure that firefighters and everybody knows exactly what we're doing. We have public safety supervisors. We're the only one in the utility industry that have these. They meet with fire chiefs on a regular basis, meet with them twice a year, uh, go over where is the pipe, do our police and fire have access to that map, do we know how to respond, and we are out in the community letting people know exactly what, what it means to live with a gas transmission pipe in their neighborhood. So. What is an ideal world for us when it comes to a transmission pipe? This is our ideal world. This is the veg standard that is filed with CPUC. And what it says is five feet on either side of the pipe, we'd like to see grass and low level vegetation. Five to 10 feet, we would like to see shrubbery, nothing with a woody consistency. 10 feet and outside is where we would like to start to see trees. We prefer crepe myrtles at 10 feet and oaks and stuff at 14 feet. This is what we would like in an ideal world. We don't live in an ideal world. And so as we looked at this and we said, you know, somebody might say we're trying to clear cut or we're trying to do something, we're trying to change the nature of your neighborhoods overnight. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to work with you. So what we have done is we have been starting to meet with staff. We said, we've looked at the pipe, we've looked at the 14 feet, and you know, there's some trees within the 14 feet that can stay and live a long, happy, healthy life, okay? It's what we call our integrity management standard. And what we do is we've been going tree by tree. Actually, today at 1 o'clock, we <laughs> did a couple tree by tree visits um, and looked at all of those trees. And your street trees, okay, there's 109 street trees. There's 109 trees that are within 14 feet of the pipe. Of the, and we call out trees no matter what the size. It doesn't matter if it's a little sapling or if it's a big, huge tree. We call it out, okay? And we're saying we're committed to mitigating for that. But we've, what we've done with those 109 trees is we went through each one, and we have found that 95 of them are manageable trees that can live where they are and live out their full life, okay? And what that means is we've looked at lightning risk. We've looked at the issues of can we dig to a pipe, you know, through the tree roots, you know. It's hard to do that with a live tree. Um, and is there any kind of interactions with the tree roots, uh, with the pipe, and, and stuff like that. We've looked at all of those things, and there are these 14 trees. Now, on private property, there are 21 property owners, mostly out um, west, uh, I'm sorry, west Katati, and there are 21 property owners there. All of their trees are manageable. There are no unacceptable trees that are directly over the pipe. And so what we're gonna start to do is start to talk to those folks, tell them if there is a tree that is dying, then we would like to discuss with them replacing that tree. But as long as the tree is healthy and doing fine, 
that tree can stay for as long as it lives its life, and we will be coming back year after year to make sure that the tree is safe in and around the pipe. Um, so the private property issue is, is not the one where we are looking at what we need to start this discussion of what can we do for mitigation. And that's really what we're here to do tonight is to start the conversation to say, let's look at the 14 trees, what would be a proper mitigation. We want to make sure everybody understands why, what our thinking is and why we need to do what we need to do. You are not going to find us coming in here and saying, we got to take a tree, we take a tree, and then we try to explain it later. Your pipe is perfectly safe right now, okay? We are looking at being very proactive in keeping the pipe safe. We're looking at ways to make the pipe safe all the time. And today, we just want to make sure that everybody understands that we want to have this discussion with them. And we have six months to be able to have this discussion and figure out what would work and what is our thinking? Why do we feel that these 14 trees are a risk, whereas the other 95 are not? Uh, we do offer replacements. Um, what you will hear from our uh, program as we've been doing this is that we try to figure out what the right mitigation is. We always advertise a, a 15 gallon tree as a replacement just because that's the easiest tree to replace. But if we have larger trees, you're going to have more trees as replacement. Maybe some of those trees are bigger, maybe they're not. I don't know. I don't know exactly what your community is looking for, but we have time to figure out what is right for the community. And we will do restoration, and we do all of this at our cost. Like I said, we felt we could have done a better job, so we are using shareholder funds, not ratepayer funds. We're using these shareholder funds in an effort to, to get the pipe to where it needs to be and make sure that we're informing everybody of, of what's going on and what it's like to live with gas transmission. Now, with that being said, trees are a very, very emotional issue for everyone. It is for us. You know, we don't want to see trees leave. And we know the way your communities are and the way your communities are built. We don't, nobody wants to see a tree leave. But we want to make sure that the right tree ends up in the right place. And that, with that, we have put together, not only are we reaching out to community members, we're reaching out to you, but we are making sure that we mail letters to anybody that's around any of the work that we have to do. We have special community folks that work for us that not only will they do mailings and that kind of stuff, but they canvass their neighborhood. Just like when you look at kind of a political campaign, we've kind of taken the same attitude. We want to know who can see a tree that might have to be replaced, and we'll go knock on their door and have a conversation with them. And we'll leave door hangers for them. And you'll get to have one person that you talk to who has a name. Uh, the customer outreach person for here in Katati is Christine Labacus, and we will get you all of that information. If you, if you, as elected officials, need any information, you can always call Brian as well. But we, we realize that we have to take the extra step to make sure that we're out in the community having these conversations. And I encourage you, anybody that, you know, if any of your constituents contact you over this, you know, you can always reach out to Brian and myself and Christine, and we'll be getting you all of those uh, things. Now, if there's anybody watching tonight, if they're not sure if they live on a gas transmission line, remember, we're only talking 21 of your residents that do live along the line that have an issue. You can go online to PG&E Pipeline Locations, type in your address, and it will show you where your house is and then show it how close it is to a gas transmission line so you can figure out where you are located. So with that being said, uh, if you have any questions, concerns, uh, Brian and I are here to answer them. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, any questions for clarification from the council? Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for the presentation. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, not wanting to get down into the weeds, are are you entertaining species of trees, or do you already have sort of a prepared list? Because I'm I'm thinking about things like uh, leaf drop, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and or trees that are like fruiting but not edible, you know, that yeah. really messy stuff, or you know, the fact that we've been in a drought for five years, and and I think. That's another consideration of tree species. So I just don't know, do you guys have a set list? And we, is that something on We don't list? have a set list. You know, I, as Brian was saying, I work the whole Western Territory. We're talking San Luis Obispo all the way up to Eureka. 
And we do not want to do a one-size-fits-all approach for every community. Every environment is different. That's where we sit with staff and we talk about what is the right tree, what is it that you're looking for restoration, those kinds of things. And we want to, we want to make this a, as easy a process for everyone, so we are willing to take the time to figure out what is the right tree. There are certain trees that you really don't ever want sure. to cast line, and we have those conversations, and we also have materials that we can hand out that have a guide to safe landscaping if people want to plant trees uh, and want to know what that is. So, okay. That's fair enough. Thank you. Councilmember Schumann? Um, no, but thank you for the time and walking through the presentation. I appreciate it. Yes, uh, no questions over here? Oh, Councilmember Lennon. Mr. Klein, you're off to a good start with me. I see you've got a quote from Chief Mark Hine at Nevada Fire. I used to work with him, so that, oh, was, did you? that was rather well done. That gave me a smile. <laughs> Nevertheless, I still have a couple of questions for oh, you. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, one general one first. You mentioned uh, in tree mitigation that's appropriate depending on the size of the tree, and yeah. you explained that a little further in your presentation, but I want to have some clarity. Is 15 gallon the largest replacement that you offer then? Or no. Could you expand on that a little no. more because I'm concerned? I really want to expand. I, well, I'm going to take one quick moment to expand on a 15 gallon tree. They're, they're the most successful to replant. And when mm -hmm. you're talking over the whole territory, we have, we have tried to just, working with our arborists and everything, they're always like, please always encourage, if somebody's going to plant a tree on their property, please ask them to do a 15 gallon. You're going to have the most successful survival rate of that tree. But when we look at the places where we're at, right, and you're looking at street trees, and in certain locations with street trees, you're looking at 24-inch box or 36-inch box, which is a large tree. You know, that, that weighs about 1,000 pounds. Um, we'll look at those locations and what would be appropriate for the location. We try not to go above a 36-inch box because we want to make sure that the trees are successful and, and work in the environment well. Um, so we work in those ranges, but if the city has certain concerns and certain ways that we can mitigate that works for the city, we're more than happy to do that. One of my greatest concerns as I've been doing this, and, and it has been ours as a company, is we want to make sure to keep tree canopy. That, um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of measurements when, if you want to be a tree city that goes into it, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of this is about carbon sequestration. You know, we do full environmental reviews of all the work that we're doing, nesting birds, all of those kinds of things. When it comes to keeping material in the environment, sometimes we'll use a lop and scatter method with, with some of the trees. And with that being said, sometimes there's mitigation that's more environmental than actually having a replacement tree. And as we have been working with cities saying what works best for you to keep your tree canopy, keep it healthy and expand your tree canopy, you know, what is it that actually will, will help you and what are you looking for? Well, good. I wanted to make sure because clearly in some of the locations, not just for the city-owned properties, but some of the private locations that run through the downtown and the Little Red, yeah. some of those trees have some significant value in terms of canopy, as you mentioned, and other values that I wanted to make sure that the replacement is truly like for like because yep. the other point I wanted to bring up, and I, I thought of this tonight because several years ago, the last time the pg &E worked on that main high pressure line through the downtown, in the southern portion of downtown where we have some colored concrete that has some nice inlaid tiles, um, that area had to be torn up to do the work, which I'm fully supportive of. But the replacement work was frankly a, a very poor quality. Uh, staff had to go through significant trouble to get people back out to do that again. And it still really didn't look that good. Uh, so I said to myself, next time this happens, I want to make sure I'm looking for what confirmation and what options we have to make sure that if we have to work on public infrastructure, the public gets back truly what they had before. And we, we are committed because we know that the pipe is safe in your community, that with the trees that we know are truly unacceptable over the line, we will not replace those trees until we have an agreement with the city on that mitigation. One of the first things Brian told me about was the tile issue. Good. I, I saw Brian. I had already, so I had already I'm glad heard you remember about that's this. good. And so I, that's why I just I want to make sure that I said we have six months to do this. You know, we have time uh, that we can talk about this. But I also want you to know that with the trees that we have a true concern about, we will not go about replacing them until we have an agreement on the mitigation and we feel that this is what's going to happen. And we traditionally start that mitigation as we're replacing the tree. So everything happens the way it should. Well, that, that, that would, would be what I would be looking for at the end of the evening is making sure there is a commitment to making sure that we avoid that issue again. 
uh, and that would be a very good thing. Because I'm fully supportive of the work. I'm a Chronicle subscriber, so I understand the new world you're living in. We've watched the front page every morning together probably for years. So, and I understand amazingly wide territory you have, too. But nevertheless, for us, it's a small town, but it's important that our people get back the value of what they have. So thank you for answering that, and thank you for making sure that happens this time. I wanted to make sure to add that we will be looking at that particular location as part of this program, stiffing it up a bit. Nice mayor. Mm. Yes, thank you for the presentation, and I'm glad that you're going to spend the time working with the property owners and city staff to make sure that everything is done in order. Um, on the trees, uh, the replacement trees, is there any type of uh, guarantee on them that they'll you know, you'll well, support we'll them for on. X number yeah, of years. Yeah, so the maintenance and establishment period of the tree, and we always work those kinds of things out. A lot of cities have landscape programs already, so do we dovetail with that program? Does it have to be a standalone program? I don't know. It all depends on what works for each city, okay. and it really depends case by case. But that's why we don't, you know, finish that. We don't replace a tree until we agree on the mitigation and we can figure out the maintenance and those kinds of issues. Because we do okay. want the trees to be successful. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was my question. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I didn't know if you're aware that we do have a history of um, transplanting trees. Yes. I don't know if that has ever occurred in any of your uh, pipeline tree it has mitigation. Not. It has not for the most part. It does depend on the size of the tree. There are times that we will find that there are trees that are saplings, oaks, right? We'll get a, an oak that will have a DBH or, you know, the round of it will be like, the size of a quarter, right? It'd be about an inch in diameter. Those we can safely move to other places and people have successfully transplanted those. The larger trees, we can't disturb the pipe below ground. And so when we work with these trees, we do all the work by hand, we go through all the environmental stuff and then we usually have to flush cut so that we do not disturb the soil. So transplanting these trees is in, in most cases is not an option. Um, but we will look at it on a case-by-case -case basis if it is. We just don't want to disturb that pipe. We don't want the soil to get disturbed. So in essence, in removing some of these trees, it's allowing for an access to the pipe if you need one, and then potentially limiting the growth of the root structure yeah. on that pipe mm -hmm. by, by killing it. Yes. For lack of Unfortunately, I, I, I hate that word. Right. We're, we're trying to keep things safe and that's where the mitigation portion is really important to us. We want to get the right tree in the right place and keep that canopy. Right. Well, in the, in the essence of uh, public safety, um, it, it's pretty important. Mm -hmm. That's one that's Absolutely. follow up on that. So uh, given that really what happens is then the root structure dies, yeah. um, have you had any problems because that in and of itself, that dying process changes really the structure around the pipe. Have you had any issues no, we with that wall? No, no, we haven't. It, that's a settling earth issue, which we have day to day, um, and, and we haven't had any issues with. There is always, we're always looking at soil stability, mm -hmm. so you're right. Um, there's always that question of soil stability, and that what is what goes into our model for those things. And we feel that the way that we're dealing with now, we, we have very limited instances of soil instability because of the tree replacement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't have any further questions. Um, thank you, and, and I appreciate you coming uh, to the council and informing the community of, of what the plans are and why we need to look at some of those things. So, yes, thank sir. you. Thank you. This is a non-action item. It's more of an informative item for something down the road, but if anyone wishes to speak on this particular item, I will open up for public comment. Seeing none, I will close it. Thank you so much. Now we will move on to 6B. City of Katati website redesign. Mr. Obid. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, Lauren, would you mind turning some lights off over there so it's not so washed out? That's how it looks in the packet. Yeah, in the packet, it's a, it's a, uh, um, it's a scan of a print 
So it's just harder to see. Um, but it's still, it's still workable for what we need to talk about tonight. So as, you, um, as, I, as I think you all know, we've begun working on the, uh, the redesign of our website, primarily to make it, um, you know, to organize it better so uh, people can find information easier and also to make it more uh, mobile device friendly, which is the predominant um, source of people's web browsing these days. It's going on with tablets or phones or whatever. And our current website is, um, is set up more for a desktop type orientation. So. Um, this, what you're seeing on the screen right now and what was in the packet is what's called a wireframe. So before they do anything, um, they create something called a wireframe. And it's really just a monochrome um, mock-up of the elements and where they would be positioned on the page. And what we're looking at is the home page. And um, I'll start at the top. There's a couple um, primary features I'll just run through and then um, we can talk if you guys have any questions. So on the top are the, are the menus. Um, this is, I think, pretty familiar for anyone that does any browsing on the website, which is pretty much all of us at, these, at this point in time. But um, the overall theme here is that I think you've, you've all probably been to websites where these menus on top, they, when they expand down, they're called, um, what the web designers call them is mega menus, because when you click on them, it opens up this menu that has, in some cases, a bazillion choices of things to click on. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the themes that we are trying to um, achieve here is to make um, things much more um, graphically driven, so driven by pictures, buttons, and not so many um, wordy hyperlinks that are, you have to search through to find what you're looking for. So um, these mega menus, if you look in some other municipal websites, they tend to be pretty big. We're, um, th the concept here is that the mega menus will be um, the, the main things that people are looking for. And so you can hopefully find them quickly if you click on them as they drop down. And the how do I at the, on the far right there would probably be the things, what the concept is, is it would be the things that people primarily come into City Hall for. So um, there's a lot of things, a lot of information that we have and a lot of things that we do, but um, the vast majority, 75% or more of the people that come through the door are really only looking for like 10 things or less, right? So the idea is that um, we create, for all the things that people generally come in for, we create an easy way for people to find that. Um, right below that, this is um, the welcome and then the search bar. So that's like Google search, except it would only search within the website. So if someone doesn't want to actually browse through and try to find something or they can't find it, they can just type in the keywords and look for it that way. Um, this pretty mountain graphic, which you can kind of see here in the sun, that's, that's just a, a placeholder. Um, there'll, be image, there'll be an image there, right? So um, the intent is that when someone lands on this page, they will um, almost immediately see um, you know, graphically what Katati is about. So, you know, that, and so that's one of the, that's one of the things that um, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about tonight is the main themes. I mean, you know, um, um, things like, um, you know, family or um, entertainment, music, um, some of the rural character, I mean, things like that. So when someone, when someone lands on this page, they'll almost immediately get a sense for what Katati is and kind of what, you know, what, how, how Katati identifies with itself. You know, so that's, that's the intent of the imaging. And then right below that is um, a series of buttons. These are called quick links. And so these are graphical buttons. They'll have probably pictures on them. Um, and these are, you can click on these or just, um, I think also just scroll through them. And these would be, you know, things that people would commonly look for that would be easy to find and right there, you know, in a big button graphically. Um, right below that is, is latest. So this would be another panel of um, rotating images, which is latest news. This would be um, akin to our current website's headlines. So we'd have, you know, um, things like that there. And then um, below that is upcoming events. And this is um, like the city calendar. So council meetings, planning commission meetings, um, uh, events in the park, things like that would be on there. And then below that is um, at the very bottom, 
would be like social media, you know, buttons to link in and then some of the, I mean, you see these on most websites where there's the common kind of links. And one of the other concepts that we were talking about is, um, and I don't know if it'll be in this bottom bar or if we add a side or top bar, you know, or if it becomes part of, when I say top bar, if it becomes part of this menu system up here, is, um, so hopefully when people land on this page, they'll find what they're looking for almost immediately and they can go to it without having to browse through a bunch of different layers of pages. Um, currently, like if someone's, if you, if someone goes on their web page now, they might have to click into a department and search through that apartment's page, try to find what they're looking for. And they might have to go three or four, you know, levels down to find it. And so we're hoping to surface all that information to the top page so people can, you know, the things that people look for most commonly. And, um, and hopefully they can get right there. But if they can't, the idea with the top bar or maybe the bottom bar is that that piece, that piece would follow the, the, um, the person through whatever page they're on. So rather than if you go into a page and you go a couple levels down, you don't have to go a couple levels back up to the home page to go back down another series of levels. You can go um, laterally across the pages because it'll have, it's like a navigation bar basically. So you can go you know, from one thing to another thing quickly without having to go back up to the home page and then back down. Um, and that would follow you through just to assist in navigation. Um, another main element that we wanna, um, that we wanna convey too is is um, sort of the business elements. So, you know, existing businesses or businesses that want to, um, looking for some place to move, that they can, um, that they can find the information looking for here quickly so that they can, um, you know, either answer the, answer the question themselves or um, learn how to quickly get in touch with the, pro the proper staff to answer those questions to facilitate um, any business needs that we have. So um, that is, that's it, kind of in a in a um, in a nutshell. And these, like I said, these are just the big elements of the homepage. And the um, and after tonight, you know, I'll be aggregating staff comments and any comments of the public and the council, and um, moving on to the next step. And the next step would be painting this out, right? So actually adding images and colors and textures, and and then starting to think about what the sub pages look like. And the themes would be similar. So if you're even if you leave the home page, it doesn't look like, I mean, I've, for example, I've seen some websites where you, the home page looks like one thing and then you go into a departmental page and you're like, am I on a totally different website or is this, you know, things are arranged differently. The idea is that the, um, the look, the feel, and the way that people access information will be the same regardless of where they are on the web page, um, which, whichever level of the page they're on. Um, so. Um, so anyway, that's that's the next step is to is to paint this home page out. Um, not to say that these things can't move, but once they add images and textures and stuff, it just it just takes longer to move things around. Um, so we want to, if I you know if if, I, if possible, we'd like to settle on kind of the main elements, and then any thoughts even as we move down the line that um, the council wants to throw out now, we can certainly add to the mix and keep it in mind as we move through the design process. And we will be coming back in subsequent stages to talk about you know, what it looks like at different points, kind of key decision points during the development of the web page. And in terms of schedule right now, we're looking at, um, if we stay on the current schedule we're on right, right now, we'd be um, going live in the springtime with the new web page. So it just takes a while to get through all that stuff and migrate the information and test it and, you know, and then make sure it's ready to go live. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Obed. Uh, any questions from the council? Council Member Um, Thank you. I think the only thing that I was noticing is that we don't have a contact info um, bullet, which may get, have been or added later. But I know that's something that as soon as I go to a website, if I'm looking around and I can't quite find something, I always go to the contact info, you know, what's their address, what's the phone number I can call to get this quicker. So that was the only comment I had. And um, I think I like the idea of um, uh, putting together sort of the images that, that um, are stand out about Katati, you know, the areas around here or the La Plaza Park and just things like that uh, that are unique to Katati. Um, so I look forward to seeing what it looks like. And definitely, I think it's great. This is a good time to, to brush up and 
get it a little bit more user friendly for folks. And so, thanks. Councilmember Kawasa. Thank you. Um, one of the first things I wrote down when I was reading the packet was some kind of thematic banner. So you already picked up on that. I think that's really wise. I think the top of every page needs to have the same banner on it. That way you know you haven't left the site and that you're still in the city of Katati. So, so that's good. Um, are you, you, you said one thing about sort of looking at the more common questions that come in to say maybe the planning department or finance or wherever. Um, are you also going to look at maybe what are the, what pages have the most hits on them? Because I think that's another uh, barometer to look for. You know, what are those common questions? And I, I don't know if you guys have thought about that as well. I think that's just another thing to look at. Um, yeah, so just on that, one of the common ways to do that is collect it through um, Google Analytics. Right. You set it up on your web page and you can track where people click. Absolutely. And that's, we are doing that. A couple other things. Uh, you know, graphically, I mean, I'll throw my two cents for what it's worth. I think in no particular order, you know, the events that we have in this city are pretty phenomenal. Um, I think the downtown, we actually have a downtown, and I think that's really important to stress. Um, music has always been a huge theme here in the city. Uh, something about the businesses, uh, again, that kind of flows with the downtown. So I'm just, I was just writing some ideas down while you could ask that question. And I think it's always good also to have just another button, excuse me, a button that says something about other resources. So um, if you're a business, you're thinking about relocating, you know, a link for like the chamber a link about our recreation programs since that's you know in its nascent stage but really starting to grow uh, and maybe something on I just like to say safety but it's pretty broad I know so is it child safety is it elder safety just you know just some kind of other resources that people might be looking for um, you could have in one of those call down menus but I think it's great uh, this is a great start it doesn't look really cool but I get the idea so that's all that really matters and we'll get there eventually so thanks Thank you. Vice Mayor Harvey. Well, not to redredge what uh, Council Member Gelasso said because he had some of the same thoughts I had, but I especially like the addition of the, the Google-like um, search because I think generally everybody is uh, Google's things since it's now a verb <laughs> and get used a lot. So I think that's helpful because right now it's really difficult to um, search and find things in our current website. So I think that it adds something that's familiar and it will help um, people finding things. But generally, from what I can tell, it, it looks okay. Thank you. Council Member Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, it is obviously at this point in time with a wireframe kind of hard to tell. It particularly, I would say in general, the concept seems very good and I'm supportive of it. Uh, clearly making the information easier for the public to navigate that's a good thing to get to. Uh, it's hard to tell because obviously we don't know what the links are yet and that choice, the, what the hierarchy of what you put out there in front of what it leads to, that, that's really what it's all about. So it's hard to comment on that, but I can give you a couple of small specific comments at least. One, generally I agree with the Vice Mayor, having the search button right out front and large like that for within the site, very good. Because uh, that's usually hard to find sometimes in older sites and that's usually, if you don't see what you want right away, that's the second thing you look for. Uh, getting more specific and uh, really picky in here, but if we look at the bottom, the bottom set of uh, hot links at the bottom, you'll notice you have some arrows for navigating them that are sitting right now over on the right. Typically, most of the more modern websites I've seen, they'll have the right arrow on the right, and then the left one will be on the left side of the banner. It looks better that way. It's more logical for people, and they figure the function out quicker. I told you I was going to get very picky in with that, but it's the one thing that jumped to mind as I was looking at that. Uh, and lastly, I agree with my colleagues in the graphics. We have a rich uh, series of images in this town, so I'm sure you have plenty to work with. But if it works thematically, there might be some value too in also mixing in images of both our history, some of our older pictures, which we're fortunate to have a lot of, and new. Uh, because we do have, besides having a downtown, we also have a history. Uh, and that might work nicely. Obviously, it'll be up to the designer. And I certainly agree with your recommendation that we have a consistent look throughout. But, but if that works, that might be a good thing. So thank you for bringing this. Looking forward to see what comes next. Thank you. Um, 
I don't have much more to add to that. I think that the uh, just the idea of having a newer site that's easier to navigate, that will be much more intuitive, and without a mega menu, will be great. And, and it'll just allow people to have greater access uh, in a more timely manner. Uh, and then they can get to the pertinent data. Um, the only other question I did have on that is, um, I imagine, and I'm not certain if this is true, but I imagine that there's different search engines that are available that we would plug into. Um, because I've gone to sites and typed in search questions or information, and they're woefully inadequate. Yeah, there are. I mean, um, if you ever tried to search anything on our with a search um, bar on our current website, it, well, I don't want to say ours, but <laughs> <laughs> a website that looks a lot like ours, it doesn't produce very good results. Yeah, um, but this is so Google basically makes a kind of plug-in widget that you can put in that that you can restrict to your web page. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it's a, it's a Google it's a Google algorithms and it's right. Google search button. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much. It's not. I, I know that we are offering suggestions and. Um, and I know it's technically not an action item, but if there is anyone in the public that would like to comment on that, I will open it up for that. Mr. Barrich. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to hear um, a report on how much this upgrade is going to cost. We haven't heard anything about cost. It may be in the, in the uh, packet in the back, but uh, a brief mention of cost. We have spent well over $100,000 over the years on, on uh, the city's website and, and um, ongoing maintenance and so forth. So cost is an issue. Um, I have an idea also that you might want to consider is that when the website pops up, how about a live chat feature where somebody in the city actually cares? Somebody's here in the office somewhere who can come on and say, hello, can I help you? Do you have any questions? Um, it's something that even the, the city council can have administrative rights that maybe in your leisure time you might want to be available through your smart device that if somebody clicks on the website, you'll be notified that someone's clicked on. You might be able to introduce yourself that, hi, I'm Mayor John Moore. Welcome to the website. Can I answer any questions for you? Um, are you navigating the website uh, successfully? Um, can I point you towards another resource? Be a nice way to kind of get in touch with the public. Um, invite interest in the city, uh, bring maybe commerce to the city, to have that type of human interaction. Most of these websites are so cold and impersonal that uh, maybe a live chat feature uh, where you have some uh, a volunteer, you have volunteers in the city who might be able to help with that. Uh, we have dispatchers in the police stations who sometimes have some idle time there that might want to be able to be notified if people are on the website, especially if they're on the police department's page of the website. Uh, maybe somebody in the planning department, somebody clicks on that link, somebody in the planning department can, can see on their laptop that someone has uh, logged in, and they may want to just chat back and say, hi, we're here, can we help you? Or the office is closed, we'll be back in the morning, here's our email address. There's a lot to consider here, but I would like to get an idea here at this level about cost. What are we looking at? Thank you. <clears throat> Those are some certainly interesting considerations. Anyone else like to address public comment? Yes. We want to be equal with everyone. Okay. So my suggestion would just be um, something with the education, also with the schools on there. You know, you were saying recreation activities and stuff, but maybe something with the schools as well. And since I'm vice president of the Education Foundation, maybe something about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address this topic? Seeing none, I'll close public comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Obed. I'm looking forward to the uh, progressions down the road on this. Uh, any changes to the final agenda? No changes. Thank you. Now we'll move on to citizens business. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the city council or speak to the council on any items listed on the consent calendar or any matters not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the Council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any item not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 
2016-01, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda, and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time uh, for reasonable accommodation if necessary. With that, I will open up citizens' business, and I believe I have a card here from Lillian Payne Vaughn. Is the audio portion? I have to thank you immensely. I can hear. It's wonderful. Terrific. It's clear. Um, I am Lillian Payne Vaughn. I live up the street at Countryside Mobile Home Park. I live at 22 Terrace Drive. And just for starters, I would like to say I live in a rent-controlled housing area in the mobile home park. Our rent just went up, um, I'm guessing, 75 to 80 percent. And there have been, has been lack of maintenance by the owners. Um, if you complain about an issue, tree, 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 that's me. I've been trying to get rid of an acacia tree in front of my house. And through lying, deceit, um, subterfuge, uh, I can't get the manager to do anything except cut the tree down that I don't want cut down. We have a rat system, and I call it a rat system because they probably um, notify each other. Ms. Vaughn, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. Can you step back from the mic just a little bit? We're getting some feedback. Okay. How's this? Look. Perfect. Is that good? Right. All right. Um, we have garbage piled up this high in the house, the lot across the street. Um, the cats on the lot next to it bring in rats, and the guy that lives there has ALS, which is commonly called Lou Gehrig's disease, and his caregiver is afraid to go in the bathroom because the cats deposit all the rats in there. We've tried to talk to the manager. I've come down here and talked to somebody, I think, in planning. And I've talked to the police a couple of times about the abandoned cars that are a significant harbor for rats. Um, I don't know what else to tell you except I'm getting sick from mite bites from rats that uh, these rats attract mites. Now, in the olden days, it used to be called the Black Plague, and uh, the um, health department would do something about it. We cannot get anything done about the rat situation, about the noncompliance, the non-management of keeping the, our park up. And then if we complain, we get a, a rent increase of, what, 75, 80 percent. And I'm lost about what to do. I can't get rid of the rats. I can't get rid of the huge acacia tree in front of my house that probably harbors rats. And I'm bit by the uh, mites from the rats. Um, uh, I go to Kaiser and they won't notify the health department. So what do I do? Uh, the police say that I have to have a request from the management or the property owner to get rid of the um, cars that are abandoned there. Two of them I know are used by a narco uh, trafficker. He hides them on that property on, in our mobile home park. The, nobody will do anything about it. Now, I would like you guys, one, two, three, four, five, to get out of your cars. Come up into our park, our mobile home park. Look, nobody's going to kick you out. They might have come out and shake your hand. But it's filthy. We're living under horrible um, physical uh, situations and psychological problems. 
and um, why can't I come down to the police department, which I did today, and I've done it a week or two ago, and say, please come up and get rid of the abandoned automobile. Nothing. They say they can't do it. It's a civil matter. Why can't I get management to cut the tree down that's harboring the rats in the park? Um, the, the mobile home that they moved, which was a complete mess, caught fire on the freeway. Um, I think it was yesterday, or yeah, I think it was yesterday when they moved that mobile home. Now, why should we have to live through that and not have a city that's responsive, uh, responding to our complaints? My complaint, the guy who has ALS, I mean, he's in a situation that is just horrible. Ms. Vaughn, I'm... Uh, Three minutes? Yeah, you've gone over by quite a bit, but uh, I'd like to say that um, your, uh, cons your concerns uh, have been voiced. Um, we will um, offer to uh, have our staff uh, try to determine what resources are available to look into that situation for you, uh, especially in some of the safety and health issues. And I know in talking with some other individuals that there is some county resources available that uh, may, them all. may allow for some of that? Call them all. The only one that responds is the vector control. Okay. They're great. Okay. But I don't think they can do much about it other than come out and say this is a health hazard. Okay. We've, we've tried everything. I have and my neighbor has. And um, nothing. We're living in a hell hole. And now if we complain about it, a rent in a rent controlled uh, housing area gets upped. And it's not going to do any good to go and get any, um, uh, try to get help. The, they just say, well, he's not getting enough money. Okay, um, please let me know. Um, uh, we will. We will have um, someone from the staff get back to you regarding some of those issues. Yeah, and I really would what, appreciate What options may be available? Um, I think I've looked into all the options, and um, I get a no. But I would really like to thank you about your system. It is wonderful. I can hear, and um, it's great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Ferrich. Good evening. Thank you, Council, for giving this woman a little more time. You know, she doesn't come to these meetings, but maybe every year or two. So it's very nice to give her a little extra time. Uh, she's a taxpayer, and she's, her concerns are very heartfelt. Um, I get a little tired of hearing residents of our mobile home parks continually to come to these meetings and complaining about conditions and giving uh, given a lot of lip service and no city service at all. I hear this from the residents, residents in the mobile home parks, and I'm convinced at this point that this council doesn't care, this staff does not care, and I would challenge each and every one of you to get up into this park and do the necessary inspections and stop giving these people the runaround. For the benefit of the audience, my name is George Barrich. I'm a former city council member here. I served with honor and distinction. In fact, I think I'm the last city council man to be elected to the city council. The gentlemen here on the city council were notably re-elected after being appointed to the city council for doing a lot of their dirty deeds and backroom politics uh, here in Katati uh, to get appointed to a seat. Um, but having said that, um, it's, I understand we don't have an honorary mayor program anymore, as I advised. Uh, we haven't seen an honorary mayor for some time. We've given, had given all kinds of excuses that it's summertime, it's springtime, it's wintertime, and it's never a good time to have an honorary mayor here, but we don't have one again tonight. And then at the last city council meeting, the council read a letter from our former city clerk, Tammy Taylor, and I had been complaining for some time that the city had claimed that she retired, and I said, no, I think she quit. And I gave reasons why I think she quit. And you read a letter, and that's a letter that was not available in the packet. 
It was a letter that was not emailed to me. It was not a letter that you put up on the wall for people to read. And the public would like to verify this letter. The very fact is, I have every indication to think that Tammy Taylor had good reason to quit. She may be looking for another job. Her retirement may be temporary right now. But the fact is, uh, she had no right to only have a private uh, going away ceremony. She's a public employee. She worked for the taxpayers. We had every right to say goodbye to her, tell her what we thought she did well, and also what she did wrong. She, and currently, she's under investigation by the Sonoma County District Attorney for Brown Act violations. All of the violations that she made by making people fill out these speaker cards well, without telling them it was optional have all been documented to this, to this uh, District Attorney's Office. So there's no wonder why she didn't want to be here, because we might have had to bring that up. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the City Council on Citizens Business? Mr. Kirkman. Giants 5, Cubs 2. Yes. Um, I think the website's a very good idea because I've come to numerous council meetings and presented concerns, asked questions, and very rarely have ever gotten a response. For example, there's a gate at Arthur Street that is a gate that at some point opened. I don't know the last time it was ever open, so it might not open anymore, but it was designed to be opened. There's a padlock on it, so I assume it's not available for everyone to open. Um, it's my assumption and my recollection from 20 plus years ago that the fire department has access to it and needs access so that they can get through, essentially have egress if they need to go down the end of Arthur Street and fight a fire and then uh, have access. Um, I brought to your attention the fact that the fire lane in uh, the end of Marsh Lane hasn't been painted since 1994. Um, some of that, and the reason it was permitted in the first place, there are two homes whose driveways were painted so that there's an actual V going right up somebody's driveway, and essentially it's not their property. It's so fire trucks can turn around and not be trapped at the end of a cul-de-sac. Um, since long ago that paint's faded, it has no real purpose, and people park in their driveways essentially where they're not supposed to because it is a fire lane. Um, other people have painted uh, over red zones and made them gray zones so they can park their cars there. Um, I won't dabble into who originated that uh, plan, but it essentially came from people in this room. Um, so it's a concern to me. You should be able to paint your curbs red, even out here. Um, it should be real clear and part of what you do. Um, it's not my place to say why you tore up the road on a Friday when you knew that nobody would be working on it until Tuesday, but that sort of thing concerns some of us that drive up and down Old Redwood Highway and haven't really been able to use it with any efficiency for three months because you never know if you're going to be able to get through or spend 20 minutes in traffic. So it would be nice to know road work ahead, road closed, expect delays. And um, the parking, temporary parking, was somewhat of a fiasco. When you have public works spending 40 minutes changing signs and they do it at 3.40 in the afternoon for a parking lot that's supposed to close at 6, and you're saying it's closed at 3.40, it adds a great deal of confusion for John Q. Public. Um, the fact that you have two reserved parking spaces in a private parking lot is confusing. I've wondered why you had two spots. To date, I haven't gotten any response. It was nice that Public Works was able to clean the lot for the first time in two years. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address citizens business? Seeing none, I will close citizens business. And Ms. Hoyer, Vice Mayor Hoyer? Well, I'm just going to comment, but if you have something, go ahead. Um, We, we will um, talk to staff in reference to seeing what's available with regard to the mobile home park and some of the safety and health issues going on over there. Um, 
having been a proponent of rent control years ago and some of the mitigation that we had available through us is now a county function, if I understand that correctly. And so we don't have a rent appeals board here like we used to. Um, but uh, the, I'm hoping that there are some avenues that can be um, investigated to help, to help address some of those concerns over there. Um, I don't know that any of these council members is going around giving mobile home park residents the runaround that was inferred. Uh, many of us have been up into those mobile home parks, especially campaigning and having friends and um, people that we know that live there. Um, so I don't, I can pretty say with a, a fair amount of certainty that we don't go up there and just give runaround to mobile home parks. Um, we suspended the honorary mayor program and have um, not brought it back yet because the school year is still relatively new. It's only been a month since they've been in school. Um, we suspended it for the summertime, but if I remember correctly, multiple times it was suggested that we eliminate the honorary mayor program, and now you're saying bring back the honorary mayor program. Okay, and any employee, whether they work for a private company, a state agency, a municipality, um, a video production company, has the right to say if they want to have a retirement fiasco, a party, event, and who they might like to invite, regardless of where they work. That's their choice. It's their retirement. They make the call. And, um, of course, we'll look into the issues on... Um, fire lane safety and painted curbs with our city work, public works department. Um, as you can imagine, we are just now coming out of this horrendous recession and enforcement and staffing have been a concern for multiple years and uh, fortunately we're getting to the point where we can start to address these things. So um, if you guys have anything further you'd like to elaborate on that or answer? Vice Mayor Harvey? So yes, I know that Public Works does go around and, and paint the curbs red because I've seen them out there, but maybe Marsh Way is, is one that somehow has gotten overlooked. So I appreciate the mayor asking that that get looked into. And I guess the only other thing that I would ask, I know that you have um, his email address, so um, I would appreciate it if you could possibly forward um, the note that we got from Tammy to Mr. Barrich so he could have that note, please. My, my understanding is that was, uh, was that not part of the packet last week? It was. It, yeah, it was. It was part of the packet. It was part of the packet. It was in the back of the staff and the table for the public as well. Okay. So there was ample public notification regarding that. And um, that was certainly her choice, and I respect her for that. So. And Mr. Mayor, if I could, just briefly, um, I also know at the DA's office that there is um, a deputy DA who specifically is charged with um, – assisting mobile home parks. So I'm gonna double check that that's still the person that I, who it used to be before I pass on the information. So once I double check that, I'll let our city manager know so that he can pass on the information. Oh, you do, okay. Okay, and do we have any direction on future agenda items? Councilmember Lamont. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I believe we discussed this, and I think staff might be bringing it back, but I wanted to check in on quiet zones again. Uh, quiet zones, yet we're hearing a lot of talk about it. So it seems to be something that a lot of communities up and down the smart line are looking at, and I'd like to see what's involved, uh, what improvements we might see for some of our citizens by there versus what the legal concerns or problems for the rest of the community might be with that. Uh, I find it interesting. I've heard a lot of concern, yet when I follow it online and see a lot of response, I'm seeing almost as many people saying they don't mind it, they're happy hearing the train. Uh, I really didn't expect that, but I'd still like to have the public discussion and see what's involved. Uh, I think that might be a good direction for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Harvey. Uh, and I understand that um, Marin County has gotten a lot closer with um, agreement on that, so I think that there's something that we can work with, and I know that that's what we were originally <laughs> waiting on was to see what happened down in Marin. And, I understood that they were a lot closer, so maybe you guys could check in to see if they finally settled on something or not. Councilmember Dawson. Not to belabor this point, 
Um, but I, yeah, I've, I've also heard from, uh, I don't know if it was from Smart or from the county, that the request for quiet zones does have to come from the jurisdiction. So we need to generate that. And with that in mind, does that mean we need to have an agendized report where we take an action to send this letter? I'm thinking we probably would need that as opposed to direction. I just wanted to check so we do it the right way. We would, we would have to have an agendized item to discuss it. There's a lot of issues around it, as you can imagine. It wouldn't be something that you'd want to just direct without knowing all the implications, right? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So that would be a future agenda item. As a matter of fact. Is that it? Anything else? Okay. And now we will uh, move on to the consent calendar. I will open it up for public comment if anyone wants to make a comment regarding the consent calendar. Seeing none, I will close it. Move to approve. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The record show passed. Thank you. And now we move on to the regular agenda items. Um, 11A, emergency shelter resolution and establishment of a safe parking pilot program. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So um, as you all recall at the last meeting on September 27th, uh, council directed staff to um, establish a limited term safe parking program with 10 spaces at 147 St. Joseph's Way, which is more commonly known as the, um, the St. Joseph's, the Caltrans St. Joseph's Park and Ride lot, lot, which is no longer owned by Caltrans. People know it as, and we also um, they also directed staff to reach out to neighbors regarding the proposed program, and then return to council tonight with a proposed program and finalized emergency shelter resolution for adoption. And um, just as for the benefit of people that are that weren't at the last meeting, the safe parking program is a program that um, was established by the county and it's being run under contract um, by Catholic charities. And this program is geared toward, um, primarily toward the newly homeless that still have vehicles but don't have a place to live. And it's an attempt to, to um, intervene early to prevent the slide into chronic homelessness by providing services and options for people when they're um, newly homeless. The program, um, how it works is that um, people that want to participate in the program um, basically fill out an application, Catholic Charity screens that application, and um, if they pass the, um, the background check that's related to that, it's not, a, not an official background check, but a, they just check into the person and make sure that um, they, they would be appropriate for the program. Um, they enroll them, and then they look for, a, for an area that, that they can park, because Katadi, like um, every other jurisdiction in Sonoma County, has no overnight camping restrictions, which um, in this case would limit people from sleeping um, overnight in cars, right? So this, would, this, um, this program is set up in places where that would be allowed. And, um, and just to clear up, one, one of the misperceptions on this is this program is not intended to be a housing program, nor is it intended to be an emergency shelter. It's intended to um, interact with these people early, early in the, um, their homelessness and provide services and, and the program. So enrolling with people, people, when people enroll in the program, they only can be in the program for six months. So they can't just stay in it forever. And um, the reason why that is, is because they want to um, get them into services, temporary or permanent housing within that six month period so that they, um, so that it moves them out of that situation into a, hopefully a, with a path for permanent housing. And it's not intended to be sort of an ongoing sleep in your car kind of thing. So um, that's just some details about the program. After the meeting um, last time, the last council meeting on September 27th, staff um, did go out at the, um, the uh, location at PRMD, it's a county administrative center, at night to see how it was actually operating. That was the, that's the biggest site currently. And um, it, there's about 50 spaces there where, where people can park. And um, the good news is, so w when staff went there, it was about half full that night. Um, the Catholic Charity staff on site said that it was, um, it normally fills up more in the, in the wintertime. So it gets closer to capacity in the wintertime. But the, um, the, uh, the site was um, incredibly unexciting. 
there was really nothing going on but a bunch of parked cars. <laughs> and um, a couple things that did come up as discussion points last time, I'll just add some clarity to. There is um, quiet times. So after 10 p.m., there's, everyone's supposed to be quiet and, and, um, and they're monitored. So Catholic Charities, their staff, they typically go out three to four times a night and, um, and look at these sites and make sure everything's okay. Um, they also obviously are available to the program participants by, um, by phone. So if there's, any, um, if there's any issues going on on the site, the um, participants themselves can call and get someone there you know, right away if there's some sort of issue. Um, and I guess this might be a bit counterintuitive, but um, one of the other things that we heard is that there's another um, faith-based organization in Santa Rosa over in Bennett Valley that recently um, started up a, a site under the program. And um, the issue they were, so um, the issue they were having actually was with homelessness. So um, there was people around the property, and the, you know, behind the property that were like camping, not in cars, but camping, and they were um, taking power or taking water and climbing the fence into the property. And so there was kind of a security issue there. And um, one of the, one of the reasons why they wanted to bring the safe parking program um, in, onto their property was that um, you have those people there all, all the time and um, those kind of things get noticed immediately and can be addressed so they're, it's not an unmonitored site all night long. So I thought that was an interesting twist that I really hadn't thought of. Um, attached to the staff report, there's the emergency shelter resolution which um, basically describes the things that we talked about last time. So that's 10 parking spaces at 147 St. Joseph's Way. The operating hours would be 7 p.m. to 8 a.m. Um, Catholic Charities would provide for restroom facilities. Um, the county sites like that, there's a couple restrooms there as well as hand washing uh, facilities. And the pilot program um, would be in place until that property is sold um, or if the city council rescinds the emergency shelter resolution for some reason um, or um, the program itself would expire on December 31st, 2017, and that resolution would automatically rescind at that time. And um, the, uh, the timing there, as I mentioned at the last council meeting, was intended to, um, to try the pilot program out and see what kind of issues come up, if there are any, and have, um, if the council wishes, have that discussion again during strategic planning um, in the spring. And it will give us adequate time to, to address it um, if, if need be, if that's the, the, the direction the council wants to go with a more permanent program. So um, that is it, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the council? Council Member DeLosser. Thank you. Um, actually, it's more of a comment. So I think when I had uh, suggested six to ten parking spaces would be a really good thing to look at. It was nice to see staff came back with ten. Um, you took it to that extent. Um, and from the previous staff report, if I remember all the numbers, uh, outside of um, the planning department up at the county facilities, which was like a 50-car area, so here the smallest city in the county is providing the second largest safe parking program in the county too, which I think is really great. This is not the end all. We've, we've addressed that at the last meeting, um, but I think it's a small but critical step, so it's great to see the staff report and the time that you did put into it because it did take us a while to get to this point. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Council Member Um Thank you. No, I wanted to echo uh, what Council Member DeLosso was saying. Um, when I've been out uh, walking uh, for the um, election, uh, a lot of people have asked me about homeless issues, and so it's been nice to be able to say, you know, this isn't a stopgap, but it's definitely a good start, and um, hopefully to to prevent people who are newly homeless from sliding down, um, becoming permanently homeless. So um, I'm, I'm really excited that we're taking a step, and I appreciate um, all of the staffs working getting this put together. So thank you. Uh, the thing that I really uh, like about this program with Catholic Charities is that it works to um, get people into the services that they need. So it gives them a place to be, and at that place they can start engaging in the services that will ultimately 
uh, get them on the, the path to being in a home. So I, I think that's always helpful because some of what you hear um, from some folks is, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to be here or there or anywhere. This gives them a place to be that someone can get to them and help getting them enrolled in services, and I think that's a good thing. I actually have a comment suggestion, but I think it'd be best to wait till after public comment, and if I might, I'd, I'd like to discuss something with council. Certainly. Um, there was a question that, ca that, I, that came back to me that I don't know that was either an accurate question or if it needs to be addressed, and that was regarding um, Golden Gate Transit stop and commuter transit bus stop there at St. Joseph Point. Is it actually in where we are considering for the park and ride, or is that bus stop on Old Redwood Highway at the beginning of St. Joseph's Way? Have we, has that been addressed, or? Um, well, the, the, um, the location for the, for the safe parking program, so the lot itself has 166 spaces, and it's okay. one of those spaces, and it okay. would be in a part of the lot that would be totally unobtrusive in terms of parking or any sort of transit needs okay. that might be. So if the Golden Gate Transit pulls into that north side of that lot at 5 in the morning, it's not going to be an issue really for those folks that may be on the... Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any large buses that go in there. I, may, there may be some paratransit or something, but... Okay. Yeah, I thought maybe the buses were right there on um, Old Red across from Walgreens. Yeah. That's the, for the large buses, that's the stop. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to get a clarification that we weren't missing something that was brought up because I, I wasn't sure that that was um, correct information. So, okay. So with that in mind, um, being that this is an action item, I will just open it up for public comment. If anyone would like to address this issue, Ms. Lobby. So I'm Adrian Lobby <clears throat> at uh, One Kingston Way. I, I'm so glad I could be here tonight because the Santa Rosa City Council was very efficient and they started at 4 o'clock, of course, but they managed to uh, approve their safe camping uh, program tonight unanimously. So uh, it's an extension of the safe parking program. There's all kinds of uh, details and, and, you know, similar to this of, of how it's actually going to work, but it does seem like that we're going to have some public encampments in Santa Rosa this winter, which is a very exciting thing. And balancing from that side, I have two friends this last two weeks who became homeless. Uh, one of them lived in the unincorporated area between Roner Park and the city of Santa Rosa, and her landlord had code violations and couldn't have the extra little space for her. And another woman timed out of a transitional housing. So it's, I, I just want to say it's very hard. I'm used to knowing homeless people at this point in my life, but it's kind of different when it's your friends and when you care about them. And so I'm really glad, like um, you said, Ms. Gilman, that to have to say, well, we're doing this. At least we have this, this option. It probably won't help either one of those people for not having a car. But uh, I think everything that we do matters. And I just wanted to say what I hadn't been able to say before when I'd been up here and forgot, is that the origins of safe parking is actually uh, security. That there have been historically businesses that have said, oh, you know, we're having some vandalism, graffiti, theft, whatever, and they would sort of hire or trade a homeless person to live in their car and protect the property. And I thought that that's a, something to say when we think about the transit riders, the Golden Gate bus and so on, is that this will probably make that area safer. Um, anyway, I, I hope that we're, you're going to support it, and I'm very glad to see it moving forward. Thank you for the good report. Thank you. Ms. Barrett. This, in reality, is a public parking program to call it an emergency shelter resolution is a fraud because it gives this illusion that Katadia is providing some type of emergency shelter, and it surely is not, and I don't want the public to be fooled. This is a public parking project. 
It's also a horrible, horrible sight to park 10 people who worked all day, they're trying to sleep out in the cold next to this noisy, noisy freeway. The city has not done any sound tests out there to see if anybody could sleep out there next to the freeway. Uh, not one person has come here uh, in application for this project. Um, not one. This resolution does nothing about the homeless problem in Katati. And Mr. Deloso's concern that there are people in this town who are homeless who could possibly freeze to death during the winter months and that something should be done. This does nothing. This is a uh, haphazard, uh, disingenuous uh, first step according to the city council and it does not address the problem. The problem is, is that most homeless people don't have cars. They don't have little, little buses and RVs and bicycles. They're homeless and they're on foot. Our homeless policy right now in Katati, and I will remind you again, if you talk to the police chief, is if there's someone homeless in town, they get a, if, if the police staff is not preoccupied, they're going to get a one-way trip, courtesy of our police officers, to Petaluma, to the local homeless shelter and they're dropped off. That is our homeless policy right now and it is unacceptable. We have plenty of facilities here in Katadi that are unused. We have rooms right next door at the old elementary middle school that are unused 99% of the time. And you say that we have no facilities. And if you read any, any letters from the packet regarding this issue or any issue, please bring it to the the citizens' attention so we can go back and check the packet. That's just a simple request. And I don't believe this is a good first step. I think this is a cop-out. It's really an insult to Mr. Deloso because, Mr. Deloso, I know you wanted more, sir. You wanted people out of the freezing cold. And what we've done is we put them in their tin boxes out there with no heat uh, next to that noisy freeway, and sure enough, if anybody dies out there from that from the freezing cold this winter, this these citizens will hold this the city council responsible because you know what the problem is, and you're kicking the can down the road and you're playing politics with this, and it's not good enough. We can do better. You have the resources to do better, and you're you're kicking your responsibility down the road. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this particular item? Seeing none, I have a closed public comment on that item. Bring it back to the council. Certainly. You had a comment I wanted to make earlier, but first I'll say on, on the issue of the noise next to the freeway, I'd agree anybody that lives next to noise, that is not ideal. But I don't think this parking place that's being proposed is any closer to the freeway than where your personal residence is on the other side of town. And I think you're able, and I believe you're able to sleep very well, so I'm hoping for the best, and I hope you will too. So, as I was going to say, and thank you for the invitation of the Grinch, it's Christmas time almost, so that's, that's appropriate. So the comment I wanted to make, actually, before we digress down this road, I noticed on packet page 31, Council, at the next to last paragraph at the bottom, uh, second sense, it mentions that the faith organizations, the churches, and etc., typically restrict participants to family or single mothers, and that public sites would, by default, get everyone else, single men, etc. Uh, and I just had a general thought, and I'd like to get your thought on it, that if I was going to make a request to Catholic charities, I would suggest that we have an order of preference that would be, number one, single mothers, number two, families, and Lastly, all others, because I wouldn't leave others out there. I can't see any reason to have an open space when somebody needs it, even if they're not, even if they are a single person. I just that doesn't seem right. Uh, and also, with that, if possible, because I believe Catholic charities indicated they could do this, if we fill up in spaces, I would like to serve wherever possible the local region more so. So, if we have somebody, for example, I heard somebody in the Pengrove area uh, recently became homeless, it would be more logical to serve somebody like that than opposed to somebody, say, from the north end of Santa Rosa or something. And, and obviously there's a lot of flexibility with this suggestion, but it's just a general request. I, I wonder if that might not be something to give them, uh, because I, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable just 
copying what the faith-based organizations are, but I do like the idea of giving a preference to single mothers and families. Thank you. Thank you. Any further? Councilmember Jolson. There, microphone's on. So, yeah, when I hear the comment, you know, if anybody dies in the freezing cold, I guess, I, I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is, where are those homeless people with a car? Who's that's who we're targeting here? Where are they sleeping now? And are they freezing to death now? So there's not a lot of logic behind that statement. Is it going to be freezing cold out there? Absolutely. Again, we're, what we're trying to do here is at a short-term level help those out who are in a terrible situation from what, for whatever reason. If it's financial, if it's marital, if it's health, these horribly unfortunate things, and we heard from Ms. Lobby that a couple of people that she's very close and, and knows, it's happened to them. I mean, these things happen, and it's horribly unfortunate. And I think, I think this, uh, what we're doing is, again, I'm so tired of repeating myself and having to say this. I'm not justifying it any more than I think I need to. It is an incredibly small step, but for those people, it's a huge step. They have a place where they don't have to worry about having knocked on their window and telling them to move on in the middle of the night. There's all kinds of issues, and again, if you want to use some logic, if they're going to freeze to death in their car at our parking program, which I highly doubt that could happen, then where are they now because they're homeless? They'd be freezing to death. So where's the logic in that kind of a statement? I'm really happy to move forward with this program, and who knows where this could go down the road, but I think for now it's a very good start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, and I just wanted to clarify. So anybody wanting to use um, the parking spaces that we're gonna be making available, hopefully, if this passes, um, would apply through Catholic Charities. That's something that they handle. They don't come to us and say, hi, I'm newly homeless, and this is really humbling, but can you please let me have one of those spaces? I mean, this is something Catholic Charities actually vets the people, you know, and then, and then also then they're able to connect them to services that may assist them in preventing them from becoming permanently homeless. Is that correct? That's correct, David. That's right. Okay. Thank you. I was just going to re reiterate that we don't take any applications for anybody for this program. It's all run through the Catholic Charities program. So nobody's approached us with an application. And then secondly, it's not a homeless shelter program. It's a resolution declaring a shelter crisis and our small step to be able to assist some of these people in a transitional program. So with that. <clears throat> looking for a motion? With that, I am looking for a direction of motion. Well, I move to adopt an emergency, emergency shelter resolution, including the establishment of a safe parking pilot program in Katadi, with an additional caveat that Council Member Landman brought up, and that is to give direction to Catholic Charities about a, uh, a preference. So single mothers, families, and the all ever famous other category at that point. And from this local. And local, as, as appropriate, yes, thank you. And I would second. So now that you have a motion and a second on that, um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a um, a caveat that we want to put on there yet if we don't even know what the flavor or the uh, component of those needing the services is going to be. I mean, we Oh, I'm, I would agree with that. I'm saying this is just a filter if we have plenty. If we open this up and the first 10 that Catholic Charities gets are all single men, then I, I would suggest that's who we serve. But if there's choices to be made, that's what I would use as a, as a way of delineating which way to go. I think the word you used was as a preference. As a, as a preference, too, because obviously there's going to have to be some judgment made about the best way to share this resource for the most benefit for the community, and I'm confident from what I've seen in the Catholic Charities, they'll make good decisions. As a um, public entity, do we want to put ourselves in a position of offering preferences to one particular group of individuals versus another group of individuals? Well, now you've got me in a question where I'm going to look at my, my city attorney, but personally as a, as a city representative and as a community person, parent, father, I'm pretty comfortable with that. But if there's any issue, 
I would like to hear. I think you have the legal ability to do that, and what I'm hearing tonight is that you're uh, stating it as a preference to Catholic Charities. You're not imposing a hard and fast restriction where you're saying well, we'll only open it up to these categories of people, and therefore I think you can do that. Yeah, I believe in my motion I was just recommending that was direction to Catholic Charities. I think that's, I hope that's what I said. And I think that's the difference than the wording that's in here about um, the faith organizations that they restrict. I mean, that's much right. more. Right. Uh, they, they have that ability. Right. I would agree having a hard restriction might be problematic, uh, and, and I think it would be hard to be workable too, given that you don't know from time to time what your resources are going to be. So, so I, I have a comfort with that if staff does. Okay. I would be fine with that. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And now we will move on to 11B, 2016 Katati Chamber of Commerce Downtown Shop and Stroll Holiday Event in Downtown Katati. Ms. Chipman, or pardon me, Ms. Chipman, I believe the staff is going to present, and then we'll call you up if we have some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. My apologies. <laughs> Um, just to give a little bit of background, the Katati Chamber of Commerce does provide multiple community events throughout the year and year after year. This year they would like to bring in a new event, which would be the Downtown Shop and Stroll Holiday event on Saturday, December 3rd, 2016. It will um, ideally be the first Saturday of every December if we are able to continue it annually. The idea is to gather Katati businesses from around the community and have them focused all in one central area on Old Redwood Highway, offering the community the opportunity to do some holiday shopping, eating, checking out the services of our local businesses and potentially other vendors if we have extra room. Um, with that, we would request that the Old Redwood Highway is closed for the day. It is a Saturday when there is not the Monday through Friday commute with a similar traffic plan to what we used for the construction that's been going on this summer and um, and rerouting traffic around down West Sierra and through Page Street or Valparaiso, leaving Charles and Henry Street open for through traffic on those streets with the crosswalks available in the middle of the event. We um, the estimated cost of this would be $850. That would be $250 for the for the street closure fee, $600 estimated for the public works of closing the streets on the Saturday. And we did recommend that we would waive those those fees since it is a first time event and um, we are supported by the chamber in many ways, um, hoping to bring in extra business to the city and and community event as well. Um, and with that, we would recommend that the City Council adopt a resolution approving the 2016 Katati Chamber of Commerce Downtown Shop and Stroll Holiday Event in Downtown Katati. We also have the Katati Chamber of Commerce president present, Sheree Chipman, who is available as, my, as well as myself to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yes. So, I'm a little unclear on exactly um, what the vendors will be. Will it only be food vendors? Will it be other businesses that just kind of set up a, if you will, a little pop-up shop? Um, yeah, so there'll be food. <laughs> I know, okay. right? There'll be food businesses. There'll be craft businesses. There'll be um, other businesses that are not in that downtown Katati area that are on the outskirts of Katati that maybe want to come in. Um, there'll be professional services like massage and stuff like that, so people who aren't located right down there can get a booth and be able to set up as a vendor. That's what I wasn't clear on is whether just food or were there other services. No, other services. And we, you know, we're um, adding, we're piggyback, piggybacking this on with the holiday tree lighting. Right. So it's part of the whole festivities. Right. Mm -hmm. well, it'll be nice to have. Um, if this passes something in downtown again, because I know we used to have uh, the downtown uh, evening. Right, uh, I remember that. The horse, and the horse and carriage. That. Yeah, yes. exactly. So it'll be nice to have. And this is nice um, with the daytime so that people um, can bring families. And stuff right, too, absolutely. So. Thank you. Councilmember Lemon. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. 
I wanted to ask, do we have a general, I have a better idea, because like Vice Mayor Harvey, I wasn't clear exactly what we were being asked to do here at all, uh, and, or who was going to be at the event beyond the businesses that are already there? Yes, so it'll be vendors that we are gonna actually um, have be able to have booths outside of the um, businesses that are there. So we actually have talked to the businesses downtown Katati already, and 38 out of 40 of them are already in for it. So um, we had somebody go out there re recently to go talk to all of them. They are all super excited about it. Um, it will be almost like I'm envisioning it more like um, if you've ever been to like the Novato Art and Wine Festival, have you have the businesses down on there and then as twice. well as all the vendor booths. Okay, well, you answered one of my questions. So I wanted to make sure that the folks in the downtown were supportive because obviously this is their yes, parking and, and drive-through traffic for the day. So, so that sounds good. The homework's been done. The other question, what I didn't see in here was a list of how many vendors we're going to have or who's signed up at this point. Do we have any outside Right now we do not have it? anybody signed up because we wanted to get it approved first for the vendor part of it. Would it be possible to have some sort of guarantee of a certain number, whatever seems reasonable? of outside vendors to make sure that this goes. Absolutely. I, I see that there's a chicken or egg problem here, mm -hmm. but I, I really need to see that there's gonna be some outside vendors to act as the draw. Because if we were to okay this and then for some reason it became very small with just mostly the downtown businesses, we might have been closing the road with essentially bringing no other Right, benefit. completely agree. That's right. what I want to Completely avoid. understand so that, absolutely. I'm not sure what that looks like, but. If you can assure us of some numbers or a cutoff that if it's not reached by a certain time that we that we don't block the traffic, I'd be, I, I think this was more fully vetted. Okay. Is that something I could bring back to the committee and then come back to you with? Maybe you could take a spitball shot at it tonight <laughs> if you'd like. That's all I'm looking for. I okay, we'll do that. Okay. I recognize that it's difficult to get everyone to sign on first, but at the same time, I, I, my only thought was I was concerned about agreeing to this with, I have nothing here in place. Right. And I have no idea the size, and I want a certain size so I can look at the public and say, there's value in closing this road down for you and right. for the businesses Absolutely. and the other businesses. And, and that's what I want to make sure of. Right. And I'm open to suggestions how to get there. I have the question. I don't have quite the answer. I was hoping you might be able to give me it. So, um, You know, to throw out a number of vendors out there, I'm to close down the streets, I'm, gosh. What were know. you hoping to get, ideally? Well, we were hoping to get over 50. Okay. So, but that is something that we have talked about loosely in the committee meetings. I'd like to see, would half of that seem reasonable? That would be great, yes. For me, for, I, I don't know what the counts, but for me personally, I would feel much more comfortable than we have a number that it's not just closing the traffic and taking right, the parking and seeing people down there. Right, right, right. So you want validation that size matters? <laughs> I don't know if I frame it quite that way, but generally speaking, I want to make sure there's some value there. Perhaps well, and I understand with I the street know. closures and everything, absolutely. Because if it's going to be a very small event, then we're not going to close down the street. Well, it's exactly. Understand. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, when I, I first looked understand. at this, the first thing I thought of was our festive holiday we used to do. And remember the, the ad or the value we added there was the horse-drawn cart. Right. Everybody liked that. That was a great thing. So I was looking, what's the value here? And if you're bringing me 25 to 50 outside vendors mm -hmm. set up in a something an analog of the art and wine festival you may want yeah to use right that is around holiday make absolutely. it more difficult for staff i've seen the wins but uh then you're bringing extra value and it's worth doing this okay can i add to that sure to add to that you know i think that it would be the best if we could um get the local folks in katati the actual businesses and that's that, what we're focusing on some of the other areas and you know I would if if, if we had a preference so that you have if you got over your number whatever that number space wise would be that they would get a preference okay um, because I think it would be best to um, give the Katati businesses opportunity first. yeah yes completely agree and that's what we are focusing on too right so you're gonna like let all the businesses know this yes. is happening great yes absolutely but, thank you me and the other the committee members not just me <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and you had already answered my question about if there had been outreach done to the to the businesses. So yeah. That's that's great that they've got the buy-in. Um, sounds like for 99% of the folks, so that's great. Um, and I think it's a fantastic idea just to increase foot traffic. I think that would be helpful for for any of our local businesses. Um, and then a, the only other thought, just 
to tag onto that one too is to maybe reaching out to the folks once we have the outlaying businesses um, set up to, to come in and, and take, claim their booth space. Um, maybe reach out to the folks who come to the farmer's market on a regular basis and see if they'd be interested in coming back for a holiday bite at the apple. So nice. Okay. Just an idea. Okay, you, then you have it. a built-in list of possible people who may be interested in coming back and who've done it in the past successfully. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, were you envisioning looking at the layout of this as the booths on the street, much like the Santa Rosa Market? Yes. And then, the, and then the ability to walk between, and then the, vent, the merchants on the sides would still have access. Yes. Yes. That was my only question. I, yeah. I, I didn't know who your graphic artist was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was that you? It was not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, so if there's no further discussion with that in mind, um, I would entertain. Yeah. Oh, pardon me. Um, you're welcome to sound, Sherry, if you like. And right now, um, since there's an action item, I will open up to the public for public comment. Uh, Corey, do you need to say something? No, I can say whatever I want. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, this project seems very logical. Sounds like a plus for the city, unlike, you know, the last uh, uh, item on the agenda was very illogical, run by, you know, emotion and feelings and so forth. This is very logical where you're taking us with this. Um, I would like to remind you, if we want to go back a few years, this whole idea about waiving fees. And that's my concern here, and I want to keep bringing it up because there are voices from the past. Janet Orchard, Pat Gillardi, Lisa Moore, Janet Kerbers. We sat in a workshop and then we went over this issue that it is high time that businesses and organizations start paying the fees uh, for using the city and coming in here and using city services because the value of what the city of Katati gives in return for those fees. And that workshop still resonates with me today that you can't take for granted the value that city staff and the city resources and the city properties give to these organizations and that the fees are reasonable and necessary. They are. And I don't care if it's a first-time event or second-time event. And if you really want to learn the art of the deal, Mr. Lamman was on track here with the fact that, you know, why don't you wave a carrot in front of this organization and say, look, if you bring in 30 signed applications, maybe we'll waive the fee. Give them something to aspire to. Give them some incentive. You can't just keep giving city services away. Everything costs money. Police, public works uh, uh, staff, planning, recreation time, staff time. You know, and, and those voices from the past, those city leaders had a point. We've got to stop giving the shop away every time somebody comes to Katati and has their hands out for free stuff. Maybe you weren't there at that workshop. Maybe Susan Harvey was there. You were pretty, pretty participatory in some of these things. But even Bob Coleman had said that you know, enough is enough. You can make any excuse for the chamber that you want, how good they do and what they bring to the city, yada, yada, yada. We've heard it a million times. But we need to start seeing the value and what the city offers these organizations and stick to it. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address this item? Seeing none, I will close public comment. Thank you. Um, The only thing I can say is I know that the Chamber of Commerce runs on a shoestring budget, has a limited number of volunteers that are um, stretched very thin, and do what they can to cooperate with the city and put the most positive face forward um, because of their pride in the, in the community and what they'd like to do. And um, I have no qualms whatsoever waiving a fee for a holiday event if we were to adopt this particular uh, motion. Um, and with that, any further comments? Just a further comment. So the one-day business license is a $15 fee, 
and using Councilmember Landman's numbers, let's say there's 25 booths. Let's assume half of those are from within the city, from a different part, not in the downtown area. So let's say there's 10 of those businesses, just as a low figure. It's $150 that we're not collecting. Probably would cost close to that amount to process all of that. So I don't see it as a great loss. I understand conceptually. I'm sorry. Hold on. I understand conceptually that um, we don't want to give the shop away. Totally get that. But I see this as a minimal amount of money. I mean, if we're talking 150 or $200, I say we just move on, move it forward. Well, yeah, I, I'm going to make a motion here, but I would agree. It says right here, this is an event that is just getting established, uh, regardless of who's running it, whether it's the chamber, who has run numerous events, some have gone a long time, or somebody brand new. Either way, it's a new event. I think there's value in supporting. Personally, I tend to think that down the road, I think we start moving towards reducing that. Uh, I think that should be kept in mind as we move down there. And that's perhaps that's the carrot, the encouragement. Let's get this up in a way that's successful for the city, for the merchants, for the chamber, and enough that it's cost effective to take care of itself. I, I think that's the goal, and it's a good one to hit. Uh, with that, I would like to move we adopt a resolution approving the 2016 Katati Chamber of Commerce downtown stop and stroll holiday event in downtown Katati with the caveat we would require a minimum of 25 uh, extra booths uh, for this to, uh, it, to go forward. And just to clarify, and then I will second, that it should be the shop and stroll. I believe that was a typo. Stop and, you know, that's right. I'm thinking of stop, drop, and roll. I'm going back a few years. Thank you. With that correction, that's the motion I'd like to make, Mr. Mayor. And I would second. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sheree. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. And I know that we're going to be going into closed session. So um, I'm going to take a quick uh, seven-minute recess, if I may. And we'll reconvene just after nine. Okay, we'll go ahead and reconvene at uh, 9.05, and the next item is the city manager's report. He would be happy to grace our presence over here. Yeah, I guess I have to be back at my seat for that. Um, all right, so thank you, Mayor, members of the council. A um, couple updates for everybody. So last Friday was um, National Coffee with a Cop Day. I think everyone heard about it. And... Um, we had a couple of our officers at Pete's Coffee in the morning, and um, and they were pouring coffee for everyone. And it was um, uh, the report back was that it was um, it was very um, a very positive thing. Everyone really liked it. Um, Pete's uh, has been very gracious in sponsoring it for the city, so Pete's provides the coffee, no charge to the city. And, and the officers pour, and they were busy pouring. Apparently, there's a lot of people there. And um, there's another one planned for November. We don't have—I don't have an exact date yet, but coming up soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was—it was, um, was well received, and um, it was good. Also, um, I—we've uh, been talking internally about um, the bike patrol, so. Um, you know, we're always looking for ways to, um, you know, to uh, provide more community engagement, you know, outside of the normal police um, citizen interaction. I mean, typically people call police because there's some issue going on or they're breaking some sort of vehicle code <laughs> and they're pulled over. And so that's, that's the typical interaction most people have. And so we're always looking for ways to provide interactions with the police officers in a more informal way outside of those kind of typical police interactions. So um, the bike patrol, and I'm not talking about a motorcycle, I'm talking about a, like a, um, I think it's a mountain bike. I don't think it's like a, you know, any sort of <laughs> other type of bicycle. Because um, bikes like, they, the cops like heavy duty stuff, so it's probably one of those really heavy mountain bikes. 
And um, it's good because it'll get him in shape. Not that he's not in shape, but it'll get him in better shape. Um, so uh, anyway, I'll stop talking about that. So Officer, um, officer Bennett Knight had um, volunteered to be um, the bike officer. And so we're in the process now of, um, of procuring the equipment and identifying training that we need before we can deploy it. And the thought is, is that when we have um, multiple, officers on, multiple officers on, that would be um, a potential opportunity to get on the bike and, um, and do some patrolling and interacting with people outside of the, outside of the vehicle. So look for that in the near future. Uh, construction updates, the downtown specific plan project. I think everyone knows that there's paving going on right now. And it's, it's disruptive, but the good news is that it'll be over pretty quick. Um, it's, we're expected to be done with the paving to, by the end of the day tomorrow. So it should be pretty quick. But a lot of the work that was happening last week and on Monday was the prep work. So getting the, make sure, making sure the road was in um, good shape to be putting the paving on. And um, after that, in September, or I'm sorry, in, in the rest of October, we're currently expecting to um, finish the plaza monuments, which aren't there yet. That's the sign, the entry sign on the monument. Um, the mosaic on the, um, on the seat walls should be going in shortly. We'll be getting some mosaic furniture, or some street furniture, sorry, and crosswalks and striping, of course, and all that stuff will come in after the new paving is done. So um, there should be a lot happening in the next um, next month or so. And um, it'll be, once this project's done, it'll be, um, it'll be a great aesthetic improvement as well as a safety improvement, um, adding sidewalks in to our downtown where they didn't exist before, and um, bicycles, so it's bicycle and pedestrian safety, so the bike lanes will be better around the intersection of 116 and Old Red as well. And um, Orwood Highway South Rehabilitation Project, that's the project through the, through the old downtown, I'm talking the park to Page Street. That, um, that project is essentially done except for the, um, the crosswalks. And those crosswalks will go in at the same time as the other segment of Old Redwood Highway. They're going to come in and just do them all at the same time. And they'll all be uniform in appearance. And then um, Floody Ranch. Again, we're, um, we're nearly complete. The, tra the, new, the standard trash cans went in just this week. And um, we still have some punch list stuff we're going through on that, on that project to finish it up. And um, the next step is the, um, is the structures on site, which I have mentioned before that were in final design phase four. So hopefully that'll be going out to bid here shortly. And then West Katati Avenue water main, um, that project on West Katati Avenue has been installed. And um, um, I believe that's essentially complete except for maybe some little punch list things. And they're going to be moving over to LaSalle to put in the master meter for the Rancho uh, Katati Shopping Center. And um, we also have a new storage on-site storage tank for well 1A, which um, is a safety thing for um, easy, easier access for cleaning. That'll be going in here in the near future. And um, the St. Joseph sewer main is, um, that design is complete. And um, we discussed potentially getting, getting that, it's just an upside, it's an upside of that main from our master plan from Old Road Highway to um, the freeway where it crosses under to the west side. And we talked about doing that potentially this year before the end of the, before the winter really started. But um, we're thinking now that we're moving into the winter, it might be better just to pick it up, pick the construction up in the spring. Um, so bid it in the winter and pick it up and, you know, when contractors are looking for work. And um, so hopefully we get a better, more favorable bid price. And also um, gets you out of the wet weather so that a contractor doesn't have to deal with all that. And, um, and this is not a particular rush on it. It can happen in the spring just as easily as it happens in the fall. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, on private development projects and building permit, I mentioned before, again, we're still working on the, or the, the private developers working on the, working on the last three homes um, at Ward Drive off of uh, John Roberts Drive. And we expect those to be completed before winter. Um, the Oliver's work is still, outdoor seating work still needs to be done. Um, some site improvements at Kennedy work, but they're continuing to work on it um, at their glacial pace, it seems, but they're getting there. And, um, uh, I mentioned last time, I won't dwell on it, but South Grab Brewery on 116 and Redwood Drive is open now. It's, um, it's been very busy, so that's good news. And um, uh, moving in some private development projects and planning. Santero Way, so this, um, this project 
went to um, Planning Commission on October 3rd. This is the multifamily um, project with some commercial space on Santero Way by the train depot. So that project um, went to Planning Commission on 10-3 on and it was, um, it was recommended by Planning Commission so it will be coming to Council next. Um, right now it's scheduled for um, the end of the month to come to Council. So you should be seeing that soon. Um, 100 Valparaiso, also known as Kessing Ranch. Um, it's a 45 lot single family um, home subdivision. That's currently an environmental review. We've um, we scheduled it to go to design review. So that should be coming to design review this month. Um, Katati Villages, that's the previously approved project on Highway 116 in Alder. And um, we expect that to go to hearing to design review in the wintertime sometime. We're waiting on the final application to our final revised application to bring it forward. And then um, I mentioned to you the 8830 Orwood Highway, 25 lot residential subdivision project south of Clothier. And that's um, that's still in the review process. Um, that's the, uh, the Pink Viking project. That's still moving along. And then um, the signed ordinance, you adopted that tonight. Um, fee deferral program, that's um, development impact fees deferring them to a later point in the, in the development process. Um, that's the proposal at least. And that would be coming to council at the next meeting. So the 22nd, I believe it is. Anyway, the, the last meeting in October. And then the building code update for 2017, um, that's scheduled to come to council in November. On the recreation front, um, we currently have ongoing programs for um, ballet for children ages three to nine. Aikido and Zumba gold classes for all ages are still going on. Um, upcoming programs include our children and family Spanish classes beginning on October 27th for children ages four and under to work with their family to learn basic Spanish. Um, a three-day camp from Monday through Wednesday during the Thanksgiving week and a two-day camp during winter break will be offered for children ages 5 to 12 with themes like Pokemon um, and uh, video game mania and mad scientists. And um, <laughs> hopefully nothing that will damage the rooms, but I'll talk to Ashley about that. We, have, um, we, have, we also have four people signed up for our upcoming Tuscany trip and um, hope to have more people join us, not literally join us because I wish I could go too, but I, it turns out I have to pay if I want to go to that and I, <laughs> I can't do that right now. So um, uh, that's, that's going well. We're also um, making preparations for our holiday events, the annual tree lighting and the um, city's first breakfast with Santa event. I mentioned last time that we did receive that PG&E grant um, and so we were able to purchase a new pre-lit um, LED tree for the park. Um, which we hope to build on over the years and um, be able to use it from year to year. Um, we also got another uh, $2,500 grant from um, a private individual for the rec program, so that was good too, in addition to the $10,000 grant we got from PG&E. Um, and we're still uh, seeking sponsors to help turn the Katati Room into Santa's workshop and volunteers to be elves at the event if anyone is interested in either one of those things. And for more information on all these things, you can visit our website or email Ashley Wilson at awilson.katadicity.org. And um, don't forget to follow us on Facebook. And we're also on um, Nextdoor, and, and we've been posting event information on Nextdoor as well. So um, there's a lot of different, uh, in our website, of course, <laughs> there's a lot of different mechanisms that this information is getting out. So keep your eye on any one of those, whatever is your preferred um, social media route receive information. And then um, uh, lastly, I just wanted to say that we, um, we're we still we're finalizing the uh, document management system stuff and I hope to bring something forward on that soon. That's the replacement for our SIRE system, this electronic document management system for the city's records. Um, we're also working on the train depot RFP and the Fleddy Veranda Ranch RFP. Um, and uh, on the train depot, hopefully we're going to have um, some stuff really shortly on that. And um, Rhonda Fletty, I'm thinking probably November, we'll have a discussion in the council before we release that on what, what the council and what the community want to see there. And we'll start with a draft and go from there. So um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Very quick and probably easy one, I'm sure you have it. 
Uh, about the bike patrol plan, I think that's a great plan. Uh, I want to ask, obviously, I'm sure as the chief advises this, he'll have some rotation where he'd like to send his officers when he's able to have a bike officer out. But we've had the suggestion from the public in the past numerous times to ideally have a little more police presence in the downtown, not on the typical Thursday, Friday nights when we do have a very good, strong presence, but on the regular AMs, weekday AMs uh, to early evenings, and weekends potentially too. If that's possible, it works. I, I think there'd be some value in that because I would agree with those requests. Uh, I see a lot of folks down there. I think it would be great for our officers to be seen and have a chance to get some good community interaction there. Vice Mayor Hardy. I have a question about um, the new lights, the new LED lights in there. Um, are those adjustable or are they just, is that the way they are? <laughs> Someone asked me that and I, I couldn't answer that. I said, well, that's a good question. The ones on Old Redwood Highway? Yeah. Um, you know, in theory, they're adjustable. Okay. Um, and the LEDs, you can adjust them anywhere from, you know, zero to whatever level of brightness you want. But it's, um, it's something that you'd have to do light by light, and it would be something okay. that you have to, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be something you could turn a knob and change it, right? Uh-huh. Okay. Like additional work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, a couple items. So uh, I did attend the planning commission meeting a week ago, Monday, and um, one of the items that was brought up by some of the existing residences over there in Santerra was parking. As we know, that's a big issue over there. Uh, and the planning commission, if I'm not mistaken, um, was looking at the angled street parking and made an exception to the Santero plan that's uh, in existence. And I believe there is an additional 20-something parking spaces that could be picked up. And staff had, you know, also looked at that as another option. So it looked like the, um, the residents who were there that night, it was just a couple of them, were uh, happier with that outcome. So that was a good thing. Um, the paving on Old Red, knowing that this Thursday evening, but it certainly sounds like Friday, you know, we're going to be getting a, a rainstorm, one thing that... For me, as I'm aging, that's harder to see, especially at night, are lines in the road when it's raining and it's nighttime. And I'm just wondering if by Thursday afternoon, when they're kind of shutting down the work over there, if I know the bot dots can't be in that quick or stripes can't be in that quick necessarily because they're not done with all the paving, but even if like those temporary little plastic yellow things, whatever the technical term is, um, although I like that, little plastic yellow things, I think that's appropriate. Um, if some, something could be done, uh, just knowing that there's going to be some more hazards to deal with, you know, with Friday rain coming in and, again, Sunday rain coming in. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And lastly, um, is there a height restriction for elves? I didn't know if there was or not. But you can answer that offline. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was just going to add also, because you talked about the, the new business, um, Sweet Expectations is now open. Um, and I already went in and lodged my complaint about caloric intake is going to increase. So, But that's okay. She was okay with it. And um, actually, it's really charming if anybody gets a chance to go in. They've got some really funny signs up on the wall. My father was visiting from Seattle, so um, he already has partaken um, when we did our volunteer work. So. Um, that was great. And then also um, about the ELF volunteers, um, if, if it's possible, I've got, had people approach me about um, kids who need to get their volunteer hours. So if it's possible to tie those two things together, I may have four instant volunteers for you. Did you indicate what day uh, Santa's workshop thing was going to be? I did not, um, but it's, I believe it's on our website. I okay. wonder if that would be the same day as they may do the holiday uh, shop and stroll. No, it's not. Um, it's, I believe it's the following weekend after the tree lighting, like the following Saturday. The, the Santa's breakfast is the following Saturday, but the shop and stroll was the next day after the tree lighting, right. which is the week before. Okay. Um, 
And then, um, I, this has probably been belabored quite a bit, but um, we have a grant for a pre-lit LED tree for the holiday tree lighting, which is precluding us from the original big tall tree that everybody loved lit. Is that what I'm understanding there? Uh, well, the big tall tree, um, the top of it can't be lit anymore. Just because we don't have the, well, we, <laughs> We, we don't have the equipment to get up there anymore, and it's just a maintenance problem. So we were looking for something a little more manageable. Hmm. Okay. Um, thank you very much for a pretty thorough report. Oh, and then uh, the other thing I was going to mention was, um, and just in case anybody had not was not familiar with it, we were, I think we referenced talking about an RFP for the Katati Depot. You guys remember that? Okay. Just want to make sure that was there. I know Damien and I had talked about it, but I, I just want to make sure that we have discussed it. So. Um, okay, thank you very much on that. And now we will move on to our um, public comment on non-action agenda items. Oh, pardon me. With that in mind, Ms. Kilman, would you like to open up the City Council member report? Certainly. Um, so on, I just have two quick ones. On October 1st, I attended the Conservation Corps' graduation. Um, they have it every year um, in October, and if you ever get a chance to go, it's really a fantastic event. I mean, any time that you think that your life is challenging, it's always amazing to hear what these students have overcome um, at dropping out of high school because you've had kids or, I mean, there was actually one guy there with three children. It was just amazing, and he's now getting his GED. And um, he spoke about wanting to give his children somebody to look up to. And it was just, it was really touching to see um, a lot of the challenges kids who had aged out of the foster care system and didn't really have the support system in place and being able to connect with Conservation Corps and helping them get job training skills and how to write a resume. I just said this was going to be quick, didn't I? Sorry. Okay, I'm stopping. I, I was just overwhelmed by the, the staff uh, dedication and the kids that um, graduated. So it was very inspiring. So definitely recommend it. It's always in October. Um, then on October 8th, um, helped uh, do some setup for the Oktoberfest. And um, my father, as I stated before, was visiting from Seattle, and I roped him into helping us set up tables and decorate. So he took that in good stride. So I showed up with not one but two volunteers. Um, so anyway, that was a really fantastic. Um, I was able to attend the event because it was my high school reunion. Um, so sorry, but that. And I did tell several people though that I'd given up going to Oktoberfest to be at the reunion. So they, they felt my my um, sacrifice. So, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember uh, One quick item. The, um, on Ag and Open Space District, we have uh, an agricultural subcommittee we started about a year ago, and we're putting together a um, staff is actually putting together, we just commented on it, um, a business plan looking at um, alternatives to the existing space where Ag and Open Space is just because of, of the cost uh, and the escalating cost of renting a space. So there'll be a proposal in the next month, I believe, going to the Board of Supervisors for some alternatives there, and um, they will become public at that point in time. So we just uh, weighed in with recommendations on the staff um, at the subcommittee level. But that was it. Thank you. Vice Mayor Herbert? I actually have no report this week. Councilmember Rennie. I'm going to echo the Vice Mayor and have no report this week as well, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Damien and I attended the REMIF um, meeting in Ukiah on the, I was looking at the date on it, the 29th, I think that was. Um, and um, the, the REMIF program is going along fairly well. Um, they will be looking at some other options coming up down the road that they may incorporate in reference to some of the benefits for the uh, employees of the different municipalities, such as um, maybe creating an opportunity for a larger group Kaiser plan that would reduce the premiums and potentially increase the benefit on there. Um, and then really examining how the uh, self-funding insurance plan is going and if it's going to still be viable down the road. And we've had a couple of cities that have offered 
Sutter folk here, um, with Sutter out there um, undercutting their premiums in order to get new business. We've had, I think it was um, Healdsburg and Windsor who have offered Sutter to their employees. At this point, it's not a considerable issue yet, but we'll have to keep an eye on that to make sure it doesn't uh, diminish the capacity of the pool of Remif. So we'll be watching that closely. Um, other than that, things are going pretty well in the Remif program right now. Um, and then I was at the League of California Cities meeting in Long Beach. Um, had some excellent presentations. Uh, one of them I thought was very good was on um, employee relations and negotiations, which uh, of course we're going to adjourn to for closed session on that. Um, some pretty good pointers in there with the medians are happening across the state and um, looking at the total compensation packages for the employees and what those really looks like. And then one of the keynote speakers I thought was a phenomenal one was um, building better blocks and talking about uh, people who may have an idea for community improvement in a dilapidated or depressed area and bringing in some temporary um, markings, um, dare I say it, street markings used with like uh, duct tape and um, planner, temporary planner boxes and maybe some temporary lighting just to give the community an idea of what it might look like and and getting the community buy-in for that particular area. And then um, if there is the, uh, the rewards that they're trying to achieve based on these um, concepts, then going to the councils in the various cities and getting the official okay, and then pulling up the temporary things and then uh, revitalizing these areas. And that program and the individuals that are part of that are called Better Blocks, and I would highly recommend looking at that on the website. And this was a, just a uh, entrepreneur, internet entrepreneur programmer out of Dallas. And he is now going um, worldwide in essence and um, showing people how they can create these changes within their communities um, in, in a minimal way and versus going through a 18, 24 month process to do a project and then spending all the architectural uh, funds for drawings, et cetera, and uh, it's just a phenomenal idea. And, and it, I thought it was a great conference, um, and it was just a, a excellent example of um, showing small neighborhood initiative and how those can make a change uh, prior to bringing in a bureaucracy to do that. So uh, that was pretty interesting, and that's all I have on those reports. And with that, now I guess we'll move on to the public comment on non-action agenda items. Mr. Parrish. I'd like to thank the city manager for a very well done report. Along the lines of that report, you spoke about the police bicycle patrol program. And I would like to say I don't think this is a very good idea. Um, you know, this is not Pier 39 in San Francisco. This is not the boardwalk in Santa Cruz. Uh, this is not uh, like Jack London Square in Oakland. This is Katati, you know, and I, I really do worry about our police officers on a bicycle, you know, competing with three and 4,000 pound automobiles and trucks on these streets, having to do their du duty. Uh, I just, I'm gonna tell you as a, as a citizen and a taxpayer, I don't, I don't like, I have a gut feeling bad gut feeling about this. Uh, we don't have good luck with police officers on motorcycles anyway, and on bicycles, I just don't feel good about it. I like the fact that when they're protected in, a, in, a, in a, an automobile, um, they're carrying weapons. It just does not jive here for this city. I also like to talk about the paving down on Old Red, the paving project, and I want to remind you how lucky we are that we voted against having trees lining the median strip, some eight or 10 foot median strip in the center of that street, how lucky we are to have convinced the council along with the fire department to avoid planting those trees. And regarding Folletti Ranch, you know, when that project came forward, we were promised that the whole character and feel of the old Charmy Katati Ranch was gonna be preserved. And you take one look at that right now and you tell me if that charm 
that old farm style charm is what you see when you look across the street because it doesn't to me. It looked very modern, very sterile, not like any kind of old ranch. And it still saddens me that that was a perfect property for maybe some low income housing project there that really could have been a benefit to the city, close to city services and city parks and the, and the baseball park and so forth. It's just very sad to see what's going on out there. And regarding the Santero Way parking issue, you know, that was a planning disaster. You know, that was a real stain on our town, how all these intelligent people on the Planning Commission and the City Council could ignore the public comment about the inadequate parking that that huge project was going to cause out there and to see the rolling eyes from the City Council members and to see what the mess the mess of the parking that we have out there today, those poor residents of Santero Way, what they have gone through and what they are going to endure going forward. Um, it's really shameful how government has gone wild there with all our talent, with all our engineers, uh, that that problem is so, so visible and so glaring. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Uh, and we don't have any information after the agenda was posted except for, we do have one item, don't we? There was, yeah, there was one uh, letter or email actually that was okay. provided. Do you, do you want to address this or do you want to, um, it's, it's informational only. Oh, informational only, okay. So we don't need to open up to public comment. Um, okay, with that in mind, I will adjourn to closed session at uh, 9.34. Thank you.